Hey everyone, it's Richie Burke. I'm back. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. We recently moved to Bayview. We're out of our old office. I also have a special guest with me, Dan Grauman, who is the co-founder and partner at HFI Consulting. He advises hundreds of businesses across the country, and he's also the founder or co-founder and partner of Brew Your Skill, which is a company that hosts interactive workshops to corporations and small business owners, teaching them how to sharpen their business skills. It also involves beer. I feel like we should be having one right now. That's right, yes, but we it, should. It, it, is, <laughs> it is about 9 a.m. on a Friday as we're shooting this, so. They don't know that. We have, <laughs> we have water, but anyway, we'll get into it today. We're gonna be giving you some practical advice to grow your business. Before we get into that, Dan, do you wanna give us a bit of your backstory? Sure. Uh, so a bit of my backstory is I, I actually started out in franchising. So when I was in college, I owned a painting franchise. You probably have heard of College Pro Painters. Yep. Uh, either your friends loved it or hated it. I happened to love it. Uh, I ran a franchise at about 20, 21 years old. Uh, made plenty of money. Ended up switching my major. And after College Pro, I continued to go into franchising where the company had me start working in the Chicago office. And I'd learn all these core business skills to find, recruit, and uh, train all these franchise owners different business skills so they could launch their very own, their very own first business as a young entrepreneur. So uh, after repeating that over and over and over again, then I moved on to another company that's a, a large restoration company that's uh, across North America. And my job was to travel the US opening and training those franchises, applying the same core business skills. Mm -hmm. So uh, long story short, with all these constant hundreds of franchisees training and training and coaching and consulting them. Uh, my business partner and I decided we were going to start our own shop out of Chicago. So that's when we started HFI Consulting. Uh, started out with realtors, and small what, law firms and all that fun stuff. What year is this around? This is uh, just uh, about three years ago. Okay. Yeah. About 2013. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry yep. for the interruption, just trying to get no, a time no, table on fine. this. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Then from starting HFI to where you're at now. Yes. How's that, how's that been? How was the startup moving from that franchising to a consulting business? How did you get that off the ground? Were there any initial struggles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starting any small business is uh, it's not a cakewalk, right? So right. Uh, I, I initially moved from Milwaukee to Chicago to, to get everything launched, uh, being closer to my business partner. So we focused on a lot of the small business owners in Chicago. Uh, we went after a lot of associations and uh, from there got in and started teaching workshops for free to mm -hmm. a bunch of realtors and other small business owners. And that's where we were able to spread the word and show what we could do. And then they at least knew if they did have a conversation that there was value add because there's so many consultants out there, you know? Yep. So to be able to show that we've got some knowledge and some things we've applied with all of our past and history with other business owners that's what got them to that next step of, yeah, you know what, let's sit down and have a coffee and see if it could work for my own business. So, yep. but yeah, it was definitely difficult to start out moving to Chicago and start with nothing uh, and say goodbye to a, a beautiful salary and have to start from scratch, you know? And so I was uh, living in a tiny little bedroom, <laughs> you know, and uh, it basically was just constantly commuting back and forth on the brown line and cocktailing and doing anything I possibly could to get my name out there and shake as many hands as possible. So um, I wish I could say that that first year was easy, but it wasn't. But we, we hit our goals that first year. Uh, the second year, we doubled the business and we apply a lot of that to starting up Brew Your Skill. So Brew Your Skill was just a concept of our business development. We wanted to create a way where we could get an environment of small business owners into a microbrew because selfishly, I wanted to drink the whole time while right. teaching. <laughs> so, so yeah, we went to uh, Goose Island in Chicago, our first workshop. We filled it to about 40 people, uh, a bunch of our current clients already, and then a lot of their friends and referrals that they mm -hmm. all brought small business owners. And uh, the idea was to give them uh, some value of a, a core competency that applies to any business owner, such as sales, which was our first workshop, teaching sales. And uh, from there, we picked up a few clients, and then we realized Brewer's Skill had something, so we kept doing it month to month. Um, Brew Your Skill really took off when we had Comcast just fill the room one day. And yep. so we had all the sales directors show up 
and uh, they came to us afterwards and said, hey, could we uh, have our own workshop where it's not in a room full of other small business owners? We want you to talk specific to our needs. And they wanted to talk about recruiting top talent and how to retain them. And so uh, we said, absolutely. So that's when private workshops were born for Brewer Skill. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a long story. I could keep talking forever, yeah. but yeah. Go Going back to that, transition when you're going from corporate your nice job to complete scrappy startup mode were there points where you almost threw in the towel or was it so exciting and such a rush it didn't matter if you were living in that small apartment and it was just like all right I'm gonna do whatever to get this done and make this happen uh, or, or was there a burnout at some point I mean I can definitely relate yeah to that or at uh, least that scrappy startup phase I would say that if you don't hit that burnout phase of those moments where you actually question whether or not you want to do this anymore, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. Yep. So I definitely, uh, I definitely had some sleepless nights or where I just, I didn't know, should I, should I go back to the salary? Should I go back to that world and have benefits? Um, do I want to have that, uh, that cushion, you know, the thing that just makes you feel like got that taken care of there's a paycheck it's always going to show up two weeks right always looks the same and I, I loved that I loved that but there was something that was just itching inside of me that I wasn't fulfilling everything that I wanted to do so I did go through that where numerous times and you know what still happens today so like we're, we're doing great uh, we're about to quadruple from last year and this year and we're still that comes with other pains you know and challenges so Absolutely. The struggle is real, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Small business owners. It's, that's what keeps it exciting, though. Yeah. That, yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Always keep chasing. Yeah. Okay, so when you're out, you're doing these workshops, you're consulting with a lot of small business owners. You see some that are really happy, really driven, really successful. You see others that are very bogged down, caught in the grind, burnt out. What are a few key things that separate the successful from the small businesses that don't make it, which is a pretty high percentage, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I would say a lot of times it comes down to two things. And um, first is knowing your path, right? Knowing what you're working towards and sticking to that, that map, that roadmap that you build. Um, and then the second thing is what I call the Rocky Balboa effect. And so, uh, really what it is is first of all you need you need to know what you want to do you need to know what your vision is what are you working towards but then you need to really spend the time building out the details of what your work is that you have to do what your activity needs to be week to week mm -hmm. to hit your monthlies to hit your quarterlies to hit your year goals it doesn't always work perfect but if you were to just jump on the road and start driving uh, aimlessly you're not gonna get to where you want to go so you got to start where's the end point of where I'm going and work backwards on that map. What streets do I turn down at what point? And it's that simple when it comes to building a business plan. So, I mean, when we started our business, we applied the same concept to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I knew how many coffees I had to have, how many beers I had to have with networks of my own to build to get to so many stages of my sales process so that I could actually earn clients. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to do. You need to figure out and can constantly be reassessing what your activity does and what your turnout is and sticking to that roadmap and constantly sticking to the plan but readjusting small bits at a time. So know where you're going, build the map, stick to it. Then the second thing is the Rocky Balboa effect. I saw you get really excited when I said that. Um, it really, <laughs> well, almost fell out of my seat. Yeah, I know, I know. You're on the, you're on the edge of your seat here. Uh, really, I mean, it's it, when you think about Rocky Balboa, he's a guy that when he would get knocked down, he'd get back up, right? And so when you were asking me questions about have you experienced, you know, wanting to quit or just stop, you know, like just do I want to do this anymore? That's going to happen. If you own a small business, it's going to happen. You're, you're going to experience that moment where you get punched in the face and you fall to the floor. The question is, can you get back up? Because the best entrepreneurs in the world are the ones that get back up like nothing happened, they're bleeding from the face. Yeah, but that's okay. That's what happens. You have to fail to win. And how, almost how do you do that? Do you think people are, how do you, do do you think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I know how I do it, but do you think people are almost wired differently or do you think the people who are good at the Rocky Balboa syndrome, they are, 
principle they have such a strong why of how they're doing it or such big goals that the issues that they face on a daily basis just pale into comparison of what they're actually going for yeah. do you do you see that trait among certain people uh you know I do a lot of hiring for some of my clients as well. And a lot of times my clients will come to me when they're trying to expand their sales team. Yep. And sales executives are no different than entrepreneurs because they make a lot of their money on commissions. So right. it's almost the same deal that I'm always interviewing for them. And what I find a lot of times, it's, it's kind of ironic, it's not always the case, but I'll, I'll find that a lot of times the, the best entrepreneurs have experienced failure a lot in their life but they always still, you can see the past. They have a habit of doing that. And it can be as simple as they, uh, they took sports very seriously in high school or college, mm -hmm. and they've experienced loss, but they train hard, they work harder, they go, 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 right? And they're not complacent. They, they're trying to figure out how to be the best, right? So you can see it as simple traits a lot of times with athletes that really work hard in their past. Um, and I've, I've found that that's been a big thing that has led to finding successful salespeople and entrepreneurs. But sometimes there is the person, too, that they just know what they have is the ultimate thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they just know this is, this is my skill. This is my thing that I can offer to the world. And I'm not going to stop because I just I believe in it, right? So they've got that magical drive that keeps going. But um, the, the real thing is it's just accepting that it's going to happen and, and controlling your emotions through those times and just knowing that you got to get back up, replan, and go and... I just I don't know if there's a magic sauce that gets you there and right. gives you the get back up piece, you know. So, yep. And then to go back, that was also a good point on when you're starting a business or when you put anything out there to the marketplace, you need to have kind of that roadmap and those goals and that long-term vision, but you also need to know that really nothing's going to go exactly according to plan. No. Almost ever. <laughs> so, no. so it's always good to be reevaluating, see how the market response to it and then adjusting and changing that long term that game plan off of that yeah i mean it's it even happens in uh a simple standing in front of a crowd and facilitating something right, right. I, i'm gonna get bad reviews right and you have to be able to accept that that's just gonna happen just like when you are doing marketing not everybody's gonna respond exactly the way you want right but are you hitting the right people and is there enough people that are getting that right response that are going to create clients and so it's just accepting that and being okay that there's going to be failures along the way and then just keep driving. But it doesn't mean ignore when there's failures there. You still need to pay attention and learn from them. Um, but it's going to happen. It's accepting that so that you don't get all down on yourself and then just stop and be paralyzed, right? So, right. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's touch on sales and marketing. A lot of small businesses out there, sales are obviously the lifeblood of any company. They need that cash flow. A lot of them don't exactly know what the best tactics are or where to go about it. There's so many different marketing and sales tax tactics out there today. What are your what's your top advice for small businesses on how to generate more sales? On how to generate more sales? On how to generate more sales. Yeah, I mean, I I would actually go back to the roadmap, right? So yeah. um, if you are a small business owner and you're in your first couple of years and you're still trying to gain traction to a revenue that can you know, pay for life, right? right. Uh, it, it probably means if you're in the service industry, there's a lot more hands to go shake out there, right? And you need to figure out what that plan is of to get to so many clients at my average job size or the average payment that I get from a client that gets me to my revenue. How many, uh, how many proposals? Do I need to do so if, if you're not great at sales and you close 33% you need to multiply that many clients by three right and you got to keep working back to, to how many networking events you need to go to how many coffees you need to have and you just need to have a plan because mm -hmm. without the plan it doesn't matter now you're just shooting blanks and, and you're just throwing darts at the board you're, you're hitting maybe a target you're blindfolded you have no idea yeah so uh, but when it comes to the actual sale, I think what happens a lot of times is uh, people are not paying attention to what their client wants or needs. And so in Simple Sales 101, you need to be asking questions, understanding uh, what it is that's actually important to them. Uh, people always talk about pain points or, or their needs. The reality is, is uh, the, the, a lot of times when I see people fail at selling, when they finally get to sit down with somebody, it's because they're not asking the right questions 
and they're not actually listening to that person. They're all thinking about how do I sell my my service, how do I sell my product? They're excited for that meeting, right? And they're not going genuinely listening to them and going, how really can I help this person by asking what's going on? What do you truly need right now? What what's what are your challenges? And then hearing it and then shutting up, right? Right. Shutting up for a moment and then validating what you're listening to and then uh, from there determining what you want to talk about that can truly help that person. Yeah, yeah, I feel I mean if you go in there, you listen, you solve the problem, can get that across and you're not a dick, you're probably going to get the sale, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean that's a simple way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> but it it sounds so simple. But the reality is, is I, you know, I spent today uh, and yesterday talking to salespeople. I listened to recorded phone calls, and then I had a follow-up feedback call with them. Yeah. And even guys that have been doing this forever, we all have our tweaks. Every time I have a sale, there are things that still need to change, right? And so a lot of times, the most common theme is, are you truly listening and asking the right questions before you open your mouth? Mm -hmm. So... And with you, you're in a service business. You obviously touched on going out, networking, trying to get your name out there as much as possible, especially at the beginning. How much of that do you do right now? Was there a point where referrals and word of mouth took over because you delivered great work? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so in the first year, uh, it, it felt like cocktails were water to me, right? <laughs> it's like, I was just constantly going out, networking, cocktailing. I had, I had some sort of association or chamber lunch or dinner or something that I was going to and constantly uh, building my team of referral people, my, you know, my friends that we would help each other out there in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and after the first year, it got to the point where we, uh, we didn't have time to do that anymore. And, and now we've got the beauty of we'll show up every once in a while still just to reconnect and stay a part of those associations, those chambers. But uh, the referrals and all the networking that's happening at this point because of all the hard work up front, it, it's paid off now. So now we get the, the beauty of having clients actually talk about our work to other people and recommend. So it's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and that definitely takes time. I can relate to that from Go Get It, where I started going door to door, and it took it took a while to get everything going. And then after that, you know, there's a point where you really have to deliver, and you also have to be searching for those good clients. And then it is nice when referrals and word of mouth those start coming in. That's definitely a good sign. You give seminars on time management. A lot of <laughs> a lot yeah. a lot of small business owners. One of the biggest complaints is they're strapped for time. They have 30 things on their plate. What do you go over there? If you can summarize those, what do you, what's your top advice for time management for a small business owner? Time management, uh, God, that is the hot topic. Uh, I think we all can take lessons from that. I mean, every time I even teach time management, I even have an, oh yeah, I have to start doing that again moment. And the common themes are, and actually the biggest enemy when it comes to time management today is Facebook, LinkedIn, I mean, we are all email these days, right? Yep. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how our technology will just take over our world. And so it's like, oh, there's another notification on my phone. Oh, the, uh, yep, I just saw another email come through. And the reality is, is you need to start taking control of when you want to accept technology communication and when you don't. Yeah. So it actually, one of the most simple things that it can start with is uh, if you have notifications on your phone, turn them off. You don't need to have your email telling you when you get an email, right? Is your email response, is it, do you have to respond the same way as a telephone that you pick up now? It's an email. The client probably is expecting you to either get back at the end of the day or within about 24 hours. And so the reality is you don't need to see that and get distracted from it. So right. turn off your notifications and only check your emails during the appropriate time. Which gets into the next topic, which the big thing for uh, controlling your time is actually blocking your time. So when it comes to emails, don't, don't do your emails except for three blocks during the day. In the morning, if you want to clear out your box for about a half hour, then do not touch your email, depending on what ser service or product you're selling. Obviously, yeah. But, uh, and then during lunchtime, have another block there, only open your email then, and then again at the end of the uh, afternoon when you want to zero out your email box. But don't be opening it on and off throughout the day. What happens is you get distracted, right? And then you go into another task because that email says to do this. 
And whatever you're working on now it takes triple the time because you constantly are in and out and you're losing your, your flow within whatever it is you're doing at that time. So block scheduling is super key. Um, and then the last thing is saying no. Mm -hmm. You don't always have to say yes. So when a client is trying to tell you, hey, can you do it at this time? And then you're going, uh, let me move this, this, and this, and this. You don't have to. It's okay. Just be like, hey, let's pull out our calendars. That time doesn't actually work the best right now. Does this time, this time, or this time within your blocks that are available, do they work? A lot of times you'd be surprised. They'll be like, yeah. And you get to control your schedule and be the best service to them because you actually are doing it the right way. If you are scrambling for them, you're probably not delivering the best service. Mm -hmm. So stop saying yes to everything and take a moment and do what's best for them as well and be ready for that meeting because it fits your schedule too. Yep. So. Let's touch on culture real quick. Culture. It's culture. It's important. So as a small business owner, a lot of people start off as solopreneurs or they'll start you know, a restaurant or something. And at some point, they need to hire. And when you only have a few people, every personality is so important, I would say. They're either adding energy to the team, they're sucking it out, sure. and, that, and that can take it out of the entire room. Yeah. What's, what's your advice on building a great culture, a place where people are excited to come work because that can make really make all the difference? Yeah, uh, I think that's another one of the big hot topics these days, right? Is every especially with millennials, right? Uh, we want to be a part of something that is a great high energy culture. We want to show up to work. If we get bored, we're out, right? We're, right. we're looking for, we're joining, we're, we're on LinkedIn because we're looking for another job. So uh, culture is key. And I, when it comes to building a strong culture, I, funny enough, it's uh, a lot of it comes with uh, transparency, right? And, and sharing with the team where we're at and where we're going and where they play a part, right? A lot of times what happens with employees, they actually don't know what their role fully is or how they play a part in the big vision. So to constantly keep the team up to date and be transparent of what's going on and where you're going, you don't have to open all the skeletons mm -hmm. in the closet to the entire company, but you, you should actually show weakness from time to time. Yep. And you should share the excitements and you should include them in during change, right? Because when employees feel change and there's no transparency of what's going on and where we're going, uh, they start to feel insecure and that's when they start to look elsewhere because they want to feel like they're in control Right, everybody wants to feel security. So right. transparency Communication uh, it, It's just gonna play a big part when it comes to culture and uh, you know We are in a day of age where when you do meetings or conferences and stuff do fun things, right? Yep. Team building can happen outside of always talking about work. It is important to them to to sit down and actually have fun and, and do things outside of just talking business. So it's pretty important to check, am I at least having some sort of quarterly event that includes my team and, and we have fun, right? And you know what's funny is uh, even for what we do, clients too, our clients, they like to have some fun too. So it's funny, you can pass culture down to clients as well and figure out how do I wanna make sure I include them in and some, some things that take us out of the, the work world as well. So. Uh, having fun, making sure it's in the calendar, and intentionally being transparent and sharing the vision and how people connect to it as far as their role will obviously help keep them, retain them, and uh, keep the business moving forward. Yeah, and I think as a business owner, it's so important to make a conscious effort. I know in the past, you know, I've had a great team meeting and events, and then all of a sudden 30 things happen and three months go by, and it's Sure. Like, yeah. okay, where'd that all go? So, yeah. my, I mean, my advice, and I'm sure you as well, is, you know, make a conscious effort planning those events on the calendar. And it's not that hard to take people to a happy hour or a baseball game or something and just getting those nailed down right away so they actually happen. It's just hard to remember to put in the calendar, right? <laughs> like, But if you put in the calendar, it happens. It does. <laughs> so it does. It does. Announce it's it. There. Get it out You're there. Going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, as we wrap up, what are you most excited right now? Obviously, you've experienced a lot of growth. What, um, what opportunities for HFI and Brew Your Skill? Yeah, so HFI is uh, it's a really exciting time right now because it went from Casey and myself as starting out this business to we already have two other partners that are joining us in the company here this summer. So as long as everything runs smooth with them, they'll be vested in the company in the next four months. And we have about 13 other guys that we're looking at right now, guys and gals that want to join the team. And so 
uh, we're looking at a long-term uh, partnership with some, some folks that are gonna be a part of our team across the nation. So we, we have somebody now that's already full-time partnering with us out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, we've got another one that's joining. You're international. That's right, we are officially international. <laughs> We picked up a bunch of clients there, nice. and uh, yeah, we, we just had Will join on from Toronto, Canada. He's full-time. It happened so quick. The intention was part-time at first, and then we call him and say, hey, never mind. Uh, we need you full-time. So, so that worked out great. We got another uh, uh, dear friend of ours that's joining from Appleton who all has great uh, coaching skills as well, and we have another one that's looking at us right now. From uh, He's actually moving to Denver, and so... We've got, a, we've got a whole slew of talent that wants to be a part of our team, and we're just excited to, to be looking at what the future could look like uh, for HFI. And then on the Brewer's skill side, we've got, I'll be in uh, Denver in two weeks here, where we've got an expo at the ATD, uh, Association of Talent and Development, and we're gonna be the only booth at the expo that's serving free beer. So oh, uh, you're that's gonna, gonna kill gonna, it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, when you're giving away free beer, uh, we have a feeling there's going to be a lot, a lot of leads rolling in oh, yeah. uh, for us traveling more around the nation and, and offering these uh, fun conferences like with cheating. beer and comedy. So yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. We're we're trying to get it to happen at the Sherm conference as well in D.C., but uh, we'll we'll see if we can make it happen. All right. Last question. You're at Go Get It right now. What is your definition of a go getter? What is my definition of a go getter? Uh, my definition of a go-getter is somebody that's like Rocky Balboa. It's somebody that can get punched yeah. in the face and get back up and continue to go get her. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Where can people find you? People can find me uh, either at the bar or, no. <laughs> we, we've got our office. Oh, you can find them there, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you can, I can be found. Uh, our office is in West Loop in Chicago, but, uh, you know, our, our local presence is at the Hudson Business Lounge as well, so... Uh, obviously, uh, you can just find us at hficonsulting.com or brewerskill.com as well. So, Awesome. Well, thank you for joining and being the first guest on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>